So, uh, welcome to my today's talk. Um, it's called Backporting Horror Stories. My name is Michal Kubeček and I'm working in SUSE in the L3 team. Uh, as I mostly focus on networking related bugs, uh, the examples will be from this subsystem, but it doesn't mean things like that don't happen anywhere else. Excuse me? Uh, networking. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure things like that happen anywhere else as well. And one disclaimer for the start, uh, this is not about pointing fingers, so it's not important about who messed the things up. The important, uh, uh, the, the important thing is if we can learn a lesson from the problems. So the idea is uh, what I will be talking about are the backports and problems with backports. Backporting patches from newer kernels to, into older ones. Uh, sorry. Backporting patches from newer kernels into older ones is always risky. Always it means a risk of regressions. The more complicated the patch and the more adjustments are needed, the bigger the risk is. But what I would like to focus on today are the patches that don't seem risky at all at the first glance. So usually these will be cases where the backport is rather straightforward, everything seems nice, the patch applies cleanly, but then the problem appears. So let's start with the first example. Sorry. Let's start with the first example. This is rather recent, about I think two months ago. It's a null pointer reference in the CTP code. It was reported as this bug number if you are interested and want to look out uh, look up. Uh, it was reported for less than SP3 teradata. Uh, which means kernel 2.6.16. So uh, it's not even the oldest kernel that we support. Uh, so uh, the short story is that the null pointer reference occurred in this place exactly, in particular here, because the key free SKB function was called with null argument. So that uh, when we tried to uh, the reference the reference counter, we got a null pointer reference and kernel crashed. Why did this happen? Why did we call key free SKB with null argument? Let's take a look at the code. Uh, this one, yeah. So th this is the relevant part of the SCTP RCV function. Yeah, this is the relevant part. So what happened here was that in this part, a CTP add backlog function returned an error. Uh, we did some partial cleanup, set SKB to null, which is correct because uh, it was already freed by this function, so we don't want to free it again. Well, go to discard release, do some more cleanup, go to discard it, uh, really convol convoluted uh, instruction flow. I really hate code like this. But anyway, in the end, we uh, end up calling key free SKB. Where does the code come from, actually? Let's take a look. Uh, the code comes from this commit. Oh, sorry, this commit. Uh, this is not the whole commit, actually. It's part of the patch that was backporting to address and CV issue. Uh, the point of the issue was that uh, uh, in this part of code, when we added a new packet to the backlog, we didn't check if we have enough space. So an attacker could uh, flood the socket by sending too many packets to exhaust our memory by overfilling the backlog because we didn't change the, check the size. Actually, this this uh, fix for the CVE was much larger, not only this CTP part, because the same problem existed in many other protocols. But this is the part relevant for us. So originally we just uh, 
called a CTP at backlog to add the packet incoming packet to the backlog. Now we call it, but check the return value. Well, originally it actually didn't, this function didn't return any value. So part of the patch was to add a return value, signalizing that there is a problem. And if we got an error, we do a cleanup. Well, uh, as we can see from the code, whenever we hit this branch, whenever he, we hit the problem, actually, whenever this fix uh, does something, we inevitably end up with calling k3skb with null argument and a crash. So the nature of the question is, how is it possible that nobody noticed in the main line? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Exactly. People familiar with the networking stack, now that key-free SKB checks its argument actually for null, and it's well used fact all around the kernel, or all around the networking subsystem at least. Uh, and if uh, we call key-free SKB with null argument, it's an OOP immediately returns. First thing it does, actually. Well, less known fact is, it does so only 6.2.6.17. And we have 2.6.16 in less than 10. It's kind of funny how uh, often fixes or things like that happen one version after the one we choose. Okay, uh, the SCTP fix uh, came with something like 2.6.34 or so. So that's a typical problem. Uh, we take something for granted, like that k3skb checks its argument, but these facts are not uh, true from the beginning of the ages. Uh, yeah, so we should kind of keep in memory that uh, some of these well-known facts only came to uh, to existence at some point in the history, and that often our kernels in our still supported products are older than that. Because uh, even now we still support, even in if in a limited way, the 265 kernel from SLAS 9. Yeah. And okay, there are not so many bugs on SLAS 9. But uh, still, we are doing quite a lot of backports for SLES 10, which is 2.6.16. And uh, due to the rapid development of uh, Linux kernel, even four-year-old kernel can be considered rather old. Yeah. And another lesson, uh, that the, the longer is the interval between the origin of the patch, the original mainline patch, and the version we are backporting to, the bigger is the risk that something changed somewhere. And as we could see now, uh, could see here, it can be a change that happened uh, somewhere in some completely different part of the code that wasn't touched by the patch at all. Uh, well, so what, uh, what could be with this bug? Uh, one solution would be to fix the SCTP code to check for null and not call KVSKB. But we decided to go a safer way and to add the null check into KVSKB to avoid such nasty surprises in the future. Great. Questions? Good. Let's take a look at another example. Example number two is the uh, bond or VLAN regression in a 3072 stable update. Uh, this one fortunately didn't get into a released uh, maintenance update. Uh, it was caught uh, while it was still in QA, so it only caused a resubmit. Uh, so, what happened? We 
in 3072 stable update, uh, we had a backport of mainline, this mainline commit, uh, fixing potential use after free. Let's take a look at what the commit does. So, it essentially moves a part of the code. Oh, screen not big enough. Oh, it, oh, it's okay. So this is a function that's called when we are removing a VLAN uh, interface on top of some other interface, when we are removing a VID. Uh, it's a bit complicated because at that point uh, we actually had two data structures keeping information about the VLANs on top of an interface. And uh, this version, 3072 version of the commit was actually a bit different uh, from the original mainline commit because uh, the, there, were some, there was some cleanup in between. Um, but it's rather straightforward and the idea is still the same. Here we are calling the NDO network device option callback to kill the VID from the device. That uh, this callback is meant to do some additional cleanup specific to that particular kind of interface. Uh, yeah, and we are simply moving it a big a bit lower. The reason for that is a subtle race condition. Because this function, this callback, can in some cases delete and free the data uh, referenced by this GRP pointer. It can in some cases. Well, it actually does so only after a grace, uh, RCU grace period. So the risk that it really is able to free the data before the data is the pointer is dereferenced here again is really low and the risk that someone has rewritten the data in between is even lower but there is a race condition potential race condition so this commit this fix addresses it by moving this call after the last place we uh, dereference the grp pointer so it's kind of straightforward and works fine. Uh, addresses the issue, everything's fine. Well, not everything. The prob problem. After 3072 stable update was released, people start noticing that when they remove uh, the last or the only VLAN created on top of a bond device, the system crashes, deterministically, always. Ah, this is not good. We introduced a fix for a potential use after free, really rare and half theoretic, and we introduced a completely deterministic crash in a quite common scenario. Yeah? Uh, no, actually, uh, I was lucky to notice a mail about this problem in the uh, stable, the uh, stable list, uh, kernel stable list. So I noticed that and I realized that uh, it does actually uh, would affect us because at that time we had in QA uh, maintenance update based on 3074, and the. The patch was actually reverted in 3075. So we just hit the window. So fortunately, it didn't get into a released maintenance update, but so only caused a resubmit. But at that time, uh, it was a really unlucky update. If I remember correctly, it was resubmitted about three times before uh, because of dif uh, different regressions. OK, so why does it crash? Uh, and where does it crash? Oh, this is no. No. 
This is the function bond VLAN RX, RX kill VID. That's the callback we were moving. Uh, this callback in particular for the bond devices. And what does it do? For certain reasons, uh, because this callback not only, not only kills the VID for the bond itself, but it also, also call, uh, kills it for the slaves of the bond. And for some reason, it has to save the uh, VLAN group so that it does actually dereference this pointer. This, uh, the function called here will dereference the first argument. So the problem is that we moved the call of this callback down after the last use, but we also moved it after the place where it's unconditionally released in the calling, uh, 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 sorry, uh, under the place where it's uh, set to zero somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's this. Uh, this callback that actually what one of the things that it does is that it sets the bond VLGRP pointer. It's yeah, it uh, sets this bond arrow VLGRP pointer to, Z, uh, to null. Yeah, that was one of the messy things in the bonding driver at those times that we actually have had two references to the VLAN group, one from the structure net device and one from the structure that's used as private data for the bonding driver. For some reasons I don't completely understand, I guess some historical reasons, uh, we referenced the same VLAN group from two different places at those times. But the problem was that in the code in between, yeah, so in this call, we uh, called a callback that nulled the bond arrow VLG, VLGRP uh, pointer as a cleanup, and now in this callback, we dereferenced it. So that was the problem. Well, uh, one simple possible fix would be to check in the RX kill VID callback to check the null if, if the VLGRP pointer is not null, which would da, do, which it really would fix the problem with the bonding driver. But the important question is uh, could this happen in any other driver? And the answer is yes, possibly. So, unless we checked all the possible network device drivers, uh, we couldn't be, we could never be sure that uh, uh, it will be safe. So, uh, and as the uh, Greg's uh, stable 3.0 branch uh, did a revert of, the, of this patch, we did the same simply. Excuse me? Uh, well, the race is not fixed, yeah, right. Uh, well, not in 3.0. Uh, but um, as I said before, as, as I explained before, the race is really rather theoretic because, uh, as, I, as I already explained, uh, you need actually two race conditions to work uh, together to get a problem. Because one is to get this callback call to release after a grace period. The data, uh, the data structure, which is one, and uh, the grace period to so the really uh, the free should take place before we get here, which is a really short window. And another problem: someone else would have to allocate and rewrite the, the data; otherwise, nothing would happen again. Yeah, so it, it would be a really, really bad luck. And that's the point here. Well, uh, what, why I showed, uh, I'm showing this example. Oh, let's, see. Uh, let's take a look, at, a look at the commit message of the original mainline commit. 
uh, yeah, uh, this commit message actually references a different data structure. That's because the changes that happened between 3.0 and uh, I think 3.10 or wherever this was introduced the fix. Poten uh, we are fixing a potential use after free uh, found by code inspection. Uh, translate in, into the human language, that means uh, we have, there is no evidence anyone ever encountered this in a real life system. And for comparison, let's take a look at another quote. You certainly know this document, the stable kernel rules document. It must, fix, uh, it must fix a real bug that bothers people. Not this could be a problem type thing. This got merged into Greg's stable tree? Uh, it did. <laughs> well, uh, and uh, the no theoretical race condition issues unless an explanation of how the race can be exploited is also provided. Yeah, so uh, from it, at least from my point of view, it clearly says this patch should never have been backported to the stable. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, um, the same applies to a great portion um, of other stable patches. Yeah, I'm afraid so. At least at that time. Since that time, there was some discussion after this, uh, I think initiated mostly by Rico Sina uh, on Kernel Summit with Greg about this. And after that, I've seen that Greg actually started to uh, reject some patches, which didn't happen before unless the patch uh, didn't compile or something. <laughs> Yeah, so now he's, uh, the th situation, I believe, is a bit better than any, that it used to be. Yeah. So I wasn't sure to understand the relationship with the present. In the present, is the code just completely different, and so everything is fine? Or uh, does the yeah, there was some clean. Uh, yeah, there there was some cleanup after three zero that uh, actually removed this VLGRP structure the VLAN group structure and replaced it by a reference counted list which is managed in a more clear and uh, more clear way so this problem uh, doesn't exist and didn't exist uh, when, in, when the mainline commit was introduced. That's also the reason why there is a different point actually mentioned here. Not the VLGRP, VLGRP but the VLAN info pointer. Could we ever hit that race condition at all since we're running without preemption? We have preempt none, right? Mm, hard to say. <laughs> really hard to say. Right. Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually, well, I would have to think a bit about that, but. I'm afraid you might be right that uh, in a non-preemptive kernel, it might be actually impossible to hit the race. So, well, that, that's even worse. But okay, but upstream is not uh, doesn't have the assumption that everyone runs non-preemptive kernel. So, but but okay, but uh, I'm not sure. But you might be right in that. Yeah. So the lesson we could and should learn from this is that we, when we are doing a backport, we should somehow keep in mind how important the fix is because uh, it could actually introduce much more serious problem than it fixes. Okay, questions, comments? Okay, example number three. This one was quite funny. Ah, this is, uh, well, funny, well. Depends on your point of view, yeah. I'd just like to make one comment on the previous one. Yeah. Um, if, if the subsystem maintainers were to be responsible to be the ones to ah, provide good point. the backports of a stable fix, then they should be aware to when a specific uh, stable patch should be backported to and the scope uh, which yeah. it could 
technically today only a few subsystem maintainers do that. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the comment because I forgot one important point. Uh, this was actually very surprising for me because uh, the networking subsystem actually has different stable rules, so the patches in networking are not submitted to Greg's mailing list directly or Mark CC stable, but David Miller personally selects which patches should go into stable and uh, passes them uh, in batches uh, to Greg. So things like that uh, happen much less often in networking than somewhere else. But uh, as we can see, the screening fails sometimes. Even that fails sometimes. Did that patch go through, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, he's only a man, <laughs> so I, I believe he just overlooked that. But uh, there is uh, the risk that it happens in networking is actually usually much lower than anywhere else, where anyone marks patches CC stable and just because he thinks oh, it, it might be good. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at example number three. This was reported again as bug, uh, this time not a crash, just uh, something not working. It was reported uh, for slash 11 SP3 by Ericsson. And uh, issue, the original issue, the original setup uh, that was reported not to work was a bit complicated, but after some experiments we found with Andreas Stachner that the basic issue or a simplified version of the issue is that if we create a McVLAN device on top of Broadcom TG3 network card, the McVLAN doesn't work. doesn't uh, send or receive. Well, it does send, it, but it doesn't receive any data. Well, two... Uh, okay, what is a McVLAN? McVLAN is a virtual device that works uh, as kind of alias to an Ethernet device. If you remember the TU0 kernels and the IP aliasing, then it works exactly in the same way, but on the MAC address level. So it's a virtual device that use, uh, uses some real Ethernet device to send or receive packets. And the only difference is that it has its own MAC address different from the underlying device. So the packets sent through this virtual MAC VLAN device have different MAC address and packets for this different MAC address are processed as received on the MAC VLAN device rather than the underlying one. Okay, that's MAC VLAN and when we created that on top of TG3 network adapter in SLES 11 SP3 it didn't work. And uh, okay, it didn't work in any SLES 11 SP3. So it was not introduced in the maintenance update. However, first observation was that it does actually work in SLES 11 SP2, which is not that surprising because uh, TG3 was one of the drivers that uh, we did a heavy backport for SLES 11 SP3. So the driver was quite different. And accidentally, uh, Andreas made another Observ important observation that once he starts TCP dump on the underlying interface, the real Ethernet interface, the McVLAN starts working, starts getting packets, which is a good clue. Uh, that's a common mistake. I always, uh, in the network trainings I did for l 2 3 I always pointed out that if you don't have a good reason to switch the interface to promiscuous mode, because you need it, you should always start TCP dump with dash P. Well, he didn't, and he noticed that when he doesn't, the McVLAN starts working, which gives you a clue, actually. Because, okay, that means that we are not receiving frames with the other MAC address unless in promiscuous mode. Well, that we do receive them in promiscuous mode, that's not a surprise, of course. We receive everything in promiscuous mode. So, the first working hypothesis was that the second MAC address was not propagated down to so-called UC list. Uh, each network interface has two linked lists of MAC addresses, MC list for multicast MAC addresses, it should receive packets for, and UC list for unicast 
MAC address. Uh, only those that are different from the device's own address. So normally the UC list is empty. Well, the hypothesis showed wrong because uh, I did uh, reproduce the issue and uh, started a, li a live correction, looked at the data structure and the address was there. But there was a difference. In SP2, the device was set to promiscuous mode. In SP3, it didn't, wasn't. So why? How is the UC list handled? We've got actually two types of network cards. Smart network cards like Intel, E1000, E1000E and so on. For those, the card itself can do smarter Mac filtering. So it can keep in the, in the adapter a list of additional MAC addresses. It should receive packets for, or, well, it always has a list of multicast MAC addresses. But the smart card can also list a list of additional unicast MAC addresses to receive packets for. Uh, the list is limited, so for example, Intel E1000E has 14 entries. So if you need up to 14 additional unicast MAC addresses, uh, the card can do it for you, for you and pass to the kernel only packets for those MAC addresses. If you add more than 14 entries into the UC list, uh, the driver switches the adapter to promiscuous mode and kernel does the filtering. Nice, perfect. Well, there are also dumb network cards. Uh, dump network cards can only handle one unicast MAC address, that one that is assigned. And whenever the UC list is not empty, the adapter is switched by the driver to promiscuous mode. Well, TG3 is a dump card in this sense. Well, actually the dump card can be considered a special case when this constant is zero. Okay, TG3 is dump, so it should be set to promiscuous mode once it has additional MAC address, which is once we have MAC VLAN on top of it. The UC list is not mm, empty, so uh, why it doesn't work? Uh, there is one difference in for the right example. Okay, so let's do it this way. Let's take a look at the code. So, uh, yeah. This is the important line that sets the NDO callback to set uh, to handle the unicast and multicast lists. And if you looked at the SP2 code, uh, the right-hand side, the handler would be actually the same, but on the left-hand side, uh, there would be NDO set RX mode. Yeah, so the difference, uh, I guess, ah, I've got it here. So this is what it looks like in SP2, and this is what it looks like in SP3. So what are those two callbacks? If you take a look at the, Mm -hmm. 
at the comment in the, the where these callbacks I described in, in include Linux net device age. Uh, this explanation is quite unsatisfactory because it doesn't tell what they are good for. So let's take a look at uh, the function that actually use them, which is dev set rx mode, which is called anytime we change the unicast or multicast list of a device. Then this function is called for this device. Uh, well, the actual function is only a simple wrapper, which adds some locking to the internal version. And the, uh, this basic version does well some sanity checks. And here is the important part. If we have the NDO set RX mode callback, we call it and do nothing else. Uh, this is the version from SP2, by the way. If we don't, we check if the UC list, unicast list is empty or not and whether this fact changed, and if it did, we adjust the promiscuity, add increment or decrement. Because uh, the promiscuity value kept by the network device driver is not a flag, it's actually a counter, because uh, we might turn the uh, interface into promiscuous mode uh, by different colors for different reasons. So we keep it promiscuous, as long as someone needs it. Okay, so this code adjusts the promiscuity, but only if we don't have this callback. And then calls the other, the set multicast list. So in the old code in SP2, well, and actually in, the, uh, sorry, I was not uh, precise. This version of dev set RX mode is both in SP2 and SP3. That's the problem. So we, uh, we either have a, a dumb callback which handles only multicast and the generic function handles the unicast for us in the simplest possible way. And for the smart cards where we can have non-trivial UC list handling, we do it in NDO set RX mode which handles both unicast and multicast list. And this is the problem because in SP3 we have actually still uh, dump function set RX mode, dump callback, which handles only multicast list, but we register it as the smart one. Why? The reason is that somewhere later in 3.2, if I remember correctly, this dev set RX mode function actually changed. Since 3.2, it looks like this. Uh, again, the sanity checks. And now we check this flag, IFF unicast FLT. If it's not set, we handle the unicast list and set the promiscuity based on it, if it's not, uh, not empty. It's the same as before, actually. But the condition is different. Well, and then always call the callback if it exists. Well, the thing is that in since 3.2, we actually have only one callback, dev set, uh, set RX mode, which either handles multicast list or both. And this flag says whether we should do the generic handling. So for the smart cards, we set this flag, for the others, we don't. So the problem was that when this was done in 3.2, all the remaining set multicast list callbacks were changed to set RX mode. And for the smart devices, we set the fil uh, filtering flag. But the problem is that when we backported this change, and we did so in the TG3 driver, we did actually introduce a bug. Because now the old dev set RX mode function had no mean to find out that uh, this card is actually dump one and it should call this code. Yeah, so let's take a look at the commits. Uh, this change in the logic of the callbacks, uh, 3 to something like 3 to RC1. Yeah. 
Can you show, so, can you show the previous code again? Uh, yeah. So this is the new one since 3.2. Uh, I'm just wondering, so, so the uh, the promise multiple is only set if that flag is not uh, In the new code. In the old, it checks whether ah, we right, have the I smart see. callback. So, so in, we, we still have this old core code. Okay, good. Yeah. The core code is, the, is still the old one. We backported only the new drivers. And that's the problem. Because they are based on the new logic, which is not true in our 3.0 3 kernel. Yeah. Because we, uh, they now registered this callback, which is supposed to be smart. Yeah. So, so one common pattern that I see in your whole, like in most of those um, bugs that you encounter, mm -hmm. is that something on the call chain above changed, and you just yeah. don't know that it changed. Yeah, exactly. So imagine, since we just have somebody here who likes working on open source tools, um, imagine you had a tool that you can give a function in, like say, I have this mm -hmm. C file, this function, please give me the full call trace of this thing, and you diff this between the new version and the old version, would mm -hmm. this actually be graspable enough or is it too big and too bloated to get a diff off? Yeah, I was thinking this way. Of course, that would mean that you would keep, uh, have to keep a library of potential problems. And then I think Coxinel or something based on it could uh, warn you about potential problems in your backports. I think uh, this is an idea that uh, definitely deserves, uh, deserves thinking about. I'm not quite sure how Coxinel would help you to find them, but so I, I mean, the first step would be to actually have something that's human, like human graspable at all. Right? Yeah, right you this, yeah you know. always uh, have uh, need to have someone understanding that there is a change in the behavior or change in the interface. Right, so the first step would be to just at least be able to print out the whole call chain. Right? Ex mm. find, find all the sub-functions you're calling, extract all the, like, un unfold the headers, unfold all the different call chain stuff. I don't know if, that's ex if it exists already. But basically, make make a big function out of a small function, right? Because your function only calls three mm. other functions, and no. you want to have all the five hundred functions those call. Yeah, uh, and the problem is that right. the, this is exactly the example where the key part is the uh, callback registered in registered in the network device operations, and it happens quite often in the kernel, which is kind of difficult to handle automatically. Because you, it needs human brain to understand the logic behind to see where it can be called and where not. So just in, in the first example, the problem was that you, after doing something, you made a call that had its sort of its preconditions had changed. So that seems possible. You could yeah. track all the changes in preconditions and all the functions in the kernel over 25 mm -hmm. versions, and then you could uh, do something to search yeah. for things that, you know, it's the intersection between what you're calling and, and mm -hmm. those changes. But this seems a, perhaps a bit more complicated. Yeah, because exactly. You have to understand the conditions. It's, there were the things with the bits and the flags and things like that. Yeah, that yeah exactly. There is some higher to, level logic behind the yeah, problem. It seems harder to fix on mm -hmm. something as something being interesting but it certainly seems worth thinking about. Yeah, so I just uh, show what the commits look like, the relevant commits look like. So f the first would be, ooh. Yeah, so this, this one was the first that introduces the flag and then adds the command setting these flags into the smart drivers. Yeah, it's rather long because it does that in a long a lot of drivers. And the other commit, and that's the commit that's more interesting to us. 
Oh. Yeah. Here. Just uh, this is this was just a cleanup commit that moved the ref, uh, the registration of the callback in all remaining drivers that used still use the old one and one of them of course was tg3 yeah. uh, well actually i must say i think something is wrong in the old version of the line yeah <laughs> This really looks suspicious, I must say, but it's not the only one, as we can see. Uh, yeah, actually, this one was really funny because it actually, actually registers the same callback for both. But uh, this one has precedence, actually. Uh, so this is interesting. This one was wrong even in upstream all the time until the previous commit. I suppose one could take a very proactive strategy here and essentially require proper architectural review of the impact of this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually um, part of, I guess, uh, one of the things that I had addressed in my talk, but uh, previously on backporting. But um, the conversation that we've had with upstream folks on yeah. that was more about how do we make backporting easier but we really haven't considered yet upstream-wise a serious architectural overhaul or review uh, on the impact on older kernels. But if if it's important, and it seems yeah. that it has been in the, the cases Definitely. that you've, you, you've explained so far, perhaps we should at least uh, try to commit to not break API or usage on older kernels. I think that, that a, a proactive strategy um, would be good, but it would require quite a bit of commitment. There's only obviously a few folks who probably would be interested, but I would get the sense that Red Hat likely runs into similar issues. Oh, definitely. They are doing the same things as us, so I'm pretty sure they face exactly the same issues. So we, if, if, it's, if it's something that we think that we can probably address with them, perhaps we mm -hmm. should collaborate with them on trying to get commitment on uh, quite a bit of overhaul review on the impact on architecture for different uh, series of kernels, mm -hmm. or at least commit to some. The only thing that I think that would be a problem is that Red Hat obviously yeah. just uses older kernels, and we're on the more bleeding edge. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, I, I would like to just to point out that if anyone in this room expected that at the end of this talk, I will give you a, a, an easy and simple rule how to avoid problems like this, well, you will be terribly disappointed. I don't have one, and uh, well, any, if anyone has, I'm um, all ears. <laughs> but I, I think the problem, the problem is complicated, and it doesn't have an easy and simple solution. Yeah, and I, I, what I exactly what I wanted to do was to point out that in some cases it's almost impossible to notice the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in this particular case, I think something in the direction of what Luis was talking about yesterday could help if it was done in advance and we have uh, did uh, have some check for this kind of problem because it's rather generic. And that's exactly the point here because if you look at this commit, uh, you must ask an important question. The, that the problem is really generic. Uh, uh, so perhaps there are other drivers affected by the same problem. Well, there are. I must admit that I didn't check all drivers. What I checked were the suspicious drivers, which were drivers with uh, significant backport in SP3, uh, which was uh, or SP2 which was uh, kind of easy because in, I think, 3.1, uh, there was a redesign of the driver tree structure, so everything was moved under drivers net ethernet. So, and the drivers with heavy back ports, we moved to that other directory, so I checked all drivers in that directory and also checked, uh, uh, well, some other suspicious for different reasons. 
And, okay, I found actually seven drivers affected by this. Three of them uh, taking part of the second commit I have shown as part of SP3 backport. Three of them doing the same actually even in the SP2 driver backport, which were broken, had broken MAC VLAN or anything with different MAC address, uh, even in SP2 all the time. And one driver that was that BNA that uh, was actually broken since introduced into, into the upstream until the kernel 3.2 and nobody noticed. Uh, actually, I say one, but it was, that was one out of the drivers I have checked. Uh, if you look at the commit I'm showing here, then in the commit messages it, no, oh, in the previous one, the previous commit uh, mentions that uh, this change actually fixes all these drivers that were wrong all the time until then. But, uh, okay, most of them are quite rare, perhaps except the first two. Okay, so this resulted in actually fixing seven different drivers, this bug. Okay, questions, comments? Okay, we should... Okay, uh, just a short one, which is uh, really nice and I wouldn't want to skip, S uh, but uh, that's really short, so we should be able to do it in five minutes. Uh, it's a really nice problem that, well, uh, this problem actually didn't result in any actual issue, in a bug or breakage, because it was, fa I found that uh, even when doing the backport, uh, because the result didn't compile because of the issue. So, okay, let's take a look at this commit. It's 11, yeah, upstream mainline. Yeah, this was a commit we were backporting uh, as part of some security fix uh, uh, because some bad interaction between UFO, uh, UDP fragmentation of load and UDP cork feature. There was some problem and uh, the fix was rather complex and complicated. Uh, and of course, as a security problem, we needed to backport it also into older code stream. Uh, the problem was that it was found and fixed after the stable 3.0 branch was closed. So we did it back, uh, the backport didn't come as part of the upstream stable 3.0. But the backport for, uh, this is actually the version from stable 3.4 and the backport into slash 11 SP2 and SP3 was simply straightforward and without any problem. One problem, and really funny problem, I noticed when I did a backport of this uh, into a uh, backport of this into slash 11 SP1, because I got a compilation error. The compilation error was because uh, the patch, which is actually backported from, I think, 3.12, introduces this function. SKB has frags, which is a simple helper inline function that checks uh, if the socket buffer has so-called frags, uh, which is checked by checking this NR frags in the shared info for the socket buffer. Well, the compilation in slash even SP1, the cherry pick was uh, simple, no conflicts or easily resolvable conflicts, but the compilation failed because in slash urban sp1 we actually already had function of this name but it was different so if i look at the 11 sp1 code oh, what's this no no that's not what i want sp3 sp1 be has for x 
Ooh. Some bros. Skip. Ah, sorry, looking to wrong file. A skip booth, of course. Yeah, the function exists, but it's different. It's checked a different, uh, <laughs> different part of the uh, different value. It checks the frag list, so called. So it's this. Is it the same? Is it is not the same? Well, it's not actually. Uh, the point is that uh, the socket buffer can have uh, two different kinds of fragmentation coming from different code paths. One is the linked list, which is the frag list, which is a simple linked list of fragments. Usually when we talk about those, we are talking about the fragments. And uh, this usually comes from IPv4 fragmentation or IPv6 fragmentation. The other, the, so, uh, which are usually called frags, are page fragments. If we have a big packet that uh, spans over several pages, then we have uh, several page fragments, called usually frags, uh, which are used for scatter together. So that we don't have to linear our eyes and create one linear big buffer. So the old version of the function checks one, the new version checks the other. So, uh, why this did, uh, didn't exist in 3.0 or in 3.12, I think? Yeah. Well, it didn't because of commit. Mainline commit which explains that the name of the function is misleading, so it should be renamed to skb has frag lists, because this, all this name indicates it checks the frags, but it actually checks the fragment list. So it's really misleading, and this came in 2637. So that's why in the 3.0 we didn't already have the function of that name, because it was already named like this, but it, uh, in slash 11 sp1 we did. Actually, uh, so the solution was easy. We just renamed the new, newly introduced function to something like I used something like SKB has frag pages or something like that. But uh, if you think about it, if we did backport a post 312 commit which used the function, the new version of the function, into a slash 11 SP1 where there existed an inline function of the same name with the same signature, checking something completely different. Would you notice? <laughs> I think th this is a real problem. When up to 2637 you have a function of certain name checking something, and from 312 on, from some later point on, you have function of the same name with the same signature checking something completely different. Yeah, okay, the new meaning makes more sense and is more intuitive and is better. But it's really uh, dangerous for the backports. Yeah, and another example uh, which I wasn't able to find, so I only simply uh, explained the problem. Uh, it wasn't a bug I was very, uh, it was a bug uh, someone else was working on, so I didn't have enough information to find that. But there was a function somewhere in the SCSI subsystem that at some point changed the semantics of the return value. Uh, one of the versions, I'm not really sure which one, but one version was that it returns zero on success and negative uh, return value on error. And the other version returned a pointer and null on error, uh, which is usually okay because the compiler warns you about the type mismatch. Well, until you use it in a condition, then you have a big problem. So uh, this is kind of similar problem as here. 
And again, I have no clear and easy solution how to avoid problems like this when doing backports. Uh, this is sometimes a problem that the uh, mainline development is so much focused on the present and on the future that anything that existed one or two versions ago, it, that's history, no one cares. Yeah. But for us and for Red Hat, who are doing a lot of backports to a rather ancient kernel version, it may be a serious problem. Okay, so comment? Yeah. So just in this case, it might be something for, to look for the fact that the file, the function moved from one file to another. So maybe that could be used. To uh, well, I think it was actually the, even in the same header file. Oh, it's in the same file? Okay. Because it's a helper function for socket buffer, so this is, uh, this is the place where it should be. Okay, so yeah. both in the new function was there also? Uh, yeah, but in different time. So until 2.637, yeah, the, yeah. the old version was there. Yeah. Then from 2.637 to 3.12, there was no function of that name. Okay, so that's And from 3.12, okay. you had a new version doing okay. something different. Okay, so at least you have something disappearing. You can notice that it disappears. And yeah. You don't have to compare the semantics in version N mm. and version N plus 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe there's something. But you there. usually don't think about things like that. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, uh, as you could see, it's a really simple helper function. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it just changes. Yeah, you mean where the function is changed? Yeah. Oh, it should be in the beginning, actually. It should be somewhere escape buff. For, yeah, this is the header. Yeah, it was just a rename. And all the other lines are changing the uses of the function. Okay. More questions, comments? So thank you for your attention and enjoy your lunch.